Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The text for the meditation today is many different texts that we're going to be looking at today, especially in the book of um, Psalms and also the book of Jeremiah. We're beginning a sermon series today called, Does the Bible Really Say That? And there's a lot of different things that we hear in our culture today. And sometimes we ourselves might even say that we think are rooted in Scripture. The one we look at today is God helps them who help themselves. The question I have for you today is, is that found in the Word of God? And the answer quite simply is, no, it's not. So my sermon is over. Let's continue. <laughs> No, but I got a lot of good things to say. I, I think it's good. Um, about this very statement, God helps those who help themselves. Right off the bat, we have to think, where in the world did this unbiblical statement come from? Well, it was generated by Aesop's fables, made famous by Benjamin Franklin in Poor Richard's Almanac in 1735. But it was based on Aesop's fables. And the story goes like this from that particular book that a wagoneer was heading off in the country one day with a wagon being pulled by horses. There was a horrible storm, and of course the road got muddy, and the wheels from the wagon got stuck in the mud. And the horses, the more they pulled, the deeper the wheels got in the mud. And so all of a sudden this guy who was driving the wagon thought, what do I do? I'll call upon the gods. And so he got down on his knees, and he looked up towards the heavens, and he said this, Hercules... Please help me. And Hercules' answer was, get down on your knees, put your shoulder to the wheel, for the gods help those who help themselves. Now we live in a pretty self-reliant culture, don't we? Where people have declared their independence of God. So much so that a lot of people have um, this willingness to go to a bookstore and get Self-help books. Yeah, you got it. And of course, the reason self-help books are so popular is that we face problems in life and there's a lot of things that are difficult and challenging and overwhelming, but we can fix them on our own. And so I was doing some research about some possible self-help books that might be coming up in the near future. Here some of them are. Here's the first one. Chickenless Soup for the Vegetarian Soul. What about this one? 7,000 Habits of Highly Compulsive People. I love that. <laughs> Here's the next one. The Joy of Sex. Choosing the Right Religious Cult. What about this one? Stupidity for Dummies. I'm okay, but you're in big trouble. <laughs> what about this one? Teaching Yourself to Read. And then... Here's my favorite. How to rip people off by writing self-help books. <laughs> well, we are pretty self-reliant, aren't we? I mean, a lot of times we hear that statement, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And out of that comes that statement, God helps those who help themselves. Now, I was talking to Pastor Tim this week, and he said, you know, in a sense, that statement, God helps those who help themselves, is true. Because the Bible says, if you will not work, neither shall you eat. And that's true. But the bottom line is, we think self-reliance is pretty powerful in life. And when we are self-reliant, we're basically saying we're pretty arrogant. Yeah, here's why. Because self-reliance makes you arrogant. How many of you have heard of Muhammad Ali? Yeah, true stories told of Muhammad Ali, who was a great boxer in the 1960s and early 1970s. He was a world champ. And many times he would go around and he'd say, I am, you say it, the greatest. And one time he called himself Superman. And lo and behold, he was getting in an airplane, sat down in the seat, didn't buckle his seatbelt. And the attendant said this, Please buckle your seatbelt. And he said, Superman don't need to buckle his belt. And she said, Superman don't need an airplane either. <laughs> buckle your belt. I love that. You know, whether it's a, a, 
sports star that we see today or a cocky three-year-old, they're both saying the very same thing. I can do this myself. And sometimes we find ourselves saying the very same thing because we're arrogant and we're declaring our independence from God. We say, I can handle this on my own. I can fix this problem on my own. And when great things happen, we oftentimes give ourselves the credit. When the problem is fixed, we give ourselves the pat on the back. And we declare ourselves totally independent of God's intervention, of God's provision, and of God's help. Look at what this scripture says. This is Deuteronomy 8, 17. I love it. You may say to yourselves, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. I want to stop right there. Many times down through my ministry, I've heard many people say, well, I've earned it. I've worked hard. I've gone to school. I've gotten the education. I have the intelligence. I put in 10, 12 hours a day. All credit, all glory to me. They don't say that at the end, but that's what they're thinking. So here it says, you may say to yourself, my power and strength, the hands have produced this wealth for me, but remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. I think of one man in our congregation who is very wealthy. And he told me years ago, he said, everything I have is all because of God. And the same man told me, it's not my money. It's God's money. It's not my wealth. It's God's provision. It's not my intelligence, it's God's gift to me. You see how self-reliance can make us so arrogant in life. And that brings us to our second major point. Not only does self-reliance make you arrogant, self-reliance makes you forget your dependence upon God. Oh yeah. There's a lot of folks today in our culture, and I may be speaking to some here today, who say, you know what? I really don't need God in my life for very much. I mean, I can do my own thing, and the only time I really need the Lord's help and provision is when I get in a tough spot. And when I get in a tough spot, I'll call upon God, and God will help me out. But other times, I'm pretty much on my own, and I don't need them. And when we're saying something like that, we're putting God on a shelf. We're declaring our independence from him, and we're saying, I really don't need God except when I'm in a pickle. Look at what the scripture says about that. This is Jeremiah 17, 5. This is what the Lord says. Cursed is a strong one who depends on mere humans who thinks he can make it on muscle alone and sets God aside as dead weight. Do you find yourself sometimes going through life, declaring your independence from God, and saying, God, I'm going to call upon you when I need you, but you're pretty much dead weight otherwise in my life. And if that is our attitude... We need to declare our repentance towards God. Because God looks upon those who are humble, not those who are arrogant, but those who are humble, who come before him with a contrite heart and say, Oh, Lord, like we sing in that song in the contemporary service, Oh, Lord, I need you. I think of that song, Lord, I need you every hour. I don't need the Lord every hour. I need the Lord every moment, every second. I think what St. Paul said to the Athenians, he said, in him, in our relationship with God, we live and we move and we have our being. I love that. I think of that hymn, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. And one of the beginning of the verses goes like this. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Stand in his strength alone. The arm of flesh may fail you. We dare not trust our own. Isn't that great? 
I think it's Psalm 121 that affirms our dependence minute by minute, moment by moment, second by second upon God. Psalm 121 says this, I will lift up my eyes into the hills from whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, in all your ways, listen to that, in all your ways, acknowledge him and he'll make your path straight. And isn't it true that sometimes we think that we can somehow contribute to our salvation? That indeed Jesus did 90% of the work but we have to do 10% remaining by not only having faith in Christ, but living a godly life. That discredits what Jesus said on Good Friday when he said, it is finished. Because when he said, it is finished, that meant this, that our sin was carried, that hell was vanquished, that Satan was defeated, and that eternal life was gained through what Christ did. He said, it's done. And all we have to do by the power of the Holy Spirit is receive it by faith in what he's done. And even the gift of faith is empowered by the Holy Spirit. For no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, for by grace are we saved through faith. And this not, listen to that, this not of, anybody know? Ourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of our works, so that we can't brag about it. Every good and perfect gift that we have in life, whether it's our possessions, our health, our family, our volition, our strength, our might, our integrity, our intelligence, all comes from one source. It's God. It's God. And I've said this a million times here, and I'll say it again. When great things happen in your life, when good gifts are produced in your everyday life, do you say this? Or do you say this? I've minister to so many people who have told me in this congregation everything I have comes from God. I don't deserve any of it. I don't deserve any of the credit. I don't deserve any of the praise. It's all God through me, in me, by me, despite me, bestowing me with these gifts. And I've never heard people say, because we know that God helps those who help themselves. True story is told of a, a young man, 35 years old, who was going to go on a business trip. And he was ready to pray with his family, and he surely did in front of all of them. He said, Dear Lord, I'm ready to leave. Please take care of Sharon, my wife, and my three kids. Keep them safe. Hold them in your care. Oh, Lord, protect them while I'm, while I'm gone. And then he said, Amen. And his wife looked at him and said this, Well, that's a real nice prayer. But who do you think takes care of us while you're here? <laughs> Psalm 121. I quoted it before. I'm going to quote more of it now. I will lift up my eyes unto the hills. From whence cometh my help? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to slip. He who keeps over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not smite you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch your coming in. And you're going out from this time forth and even forevermore. No self-help in that. No self-reliance in that statement. Today is epiphany. And we know that these wise men, these smart men, these philosophers, if you will, were guided by a star that led them to Bethlehem and they worshipped Jesus with gold and frankincense and myrrh. But what led them? 
What guided them? What sustained them? The star. What leads? What guides? What sustains us today? God through his word. Because his word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Oh yes. God helps them who helps themselves. Not biblical. Paul's words to the Athenians in Christ. We live and we move and we have our being. In 2018, may you go down the roads of life calling upon God, not minute by minute, but second by second, because he and he alone is our help and our strength. Amen? Amen. Amen. Please stand. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus until life everlasting. Amen.